<clears throat> Hi, welcome to this Global Alliance dialogue session in celebration of June, Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Month. We are happy to have today with us uh, Melissa Vela Williamson, who will be um, inspiring us in this conversation for the benefit of colleagues and friends from all over the world. So uh, for you to have an idea of Melissa's experience, I'm gonna share with you a very, very summarized bio. Melissa is an accredited internationally recognized public relations expert, national industry columnist, podcast, podcast host, and author. With two decades of multicultural and integrated communications experience, Melissa serves as consultant, trainer, and account director at her boutique firm, MVW Communications. With unique experience in internal communications and DEI, Melissa leverages her PR expertise and acumen as a certified diversity professional to create social good. Her book, Smart Talk, Public Relations Essentials, All Pros Should Know, was published in October, 2022, and quickly became an Amazon bestseller. Melissa, welcome to this session, and thank you for allowing time for Global Alliance uh, colleagues and friends from all over the world to share and, and learn from your exper experience. Gladys, thank you for having me. What a privilege, what a pleasure. I'm so glad to be here with you all today. Thank you, thank you. So uh, to begin this interesting conversation and following up on our previous contact, please tell us more about your certified diversity professional credential because I know that you have vast experience and you're also an APR, but it gained our attention that you're a certified diversity professional. What inspired you to earn this special certification in diversity? Yeah, well, let's be honest. Number one, to gain your attention, Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> But truly, I have noticed throughout my career, so I've been in practice of public relations for 20 years now. And throughout my career, I started at a Hispanic focus. Uh, boutique agency out of San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really began to learn about uh, tailoring for different types of cultures and communities and language speakers and, and really thinking about who I was communicating with and why and how they preferred to meet that communication. And while I was doing that, it, it's really been a through line in 20 years that there were elements of advocacy that I was able to incorporate into the work but then also promotion of equity. And I always found that it was best to do that in a non-polarizing way, in a way that brought people together, that connected the resources to the real needs, got rid of red tape, right? And things that were in the way of making change. And so I've loved using PR for good throughout my career. I did actually work in, um, for when I went from the Hispanic boutique agency, I moved into the nonprofit sector and I worked at Big Brothers Big Sisters, And there, what we saw, and I found quickly through my work there, and then I began my studies as a master's student in communication, is that I really believed in, um, we need to attack the root problem. What is the root cause of the situation that we have? At Big Brothers, I figured out pretty quickly, well, why are children looking for a big brother, big sister mentor in the first place? What is that inspiration for them? And when I really dug through everything, it was, well, most of these kids were coming from single parent homes and a lot of little boys lacking a father figure and looking for that male mentor. And when I understood that I could number one, relate in my personal lived experience, um, having an absentee biological father. And then number two, realizing, well, then our most precious resource here is going to be that volunteer and it's going to be that male volunteer. And in our community, we're majority Hispanic. So it's going to be numbers wise, Hispanic male volunteers. But then we had a lot of black or African-American little brothers on the waiting list for big brothers. And so while we were combating a societal issue, right? Men not uh, playing the roles as fathers as they should be. We were also trying to tackle a marketing communication PR type issue of how do you recruit these type of mentors, exactly the kinds you need. And so this concept of tailoring uh, came to me quickly. And, 
and relating to them and just telling them, look, the reason these these kids are looking for a, a mentor in the first place is just because they are missing that male, you know, experience in their life and, and you could be a great role model. Well, I realized too how much and how powerful words matter. Um, the word mentor seemed to have a lot of weight. I could see uh, qualitatively what happened in, in particularly in men's eyes when I said, you know, you could be a mentor, like, ooh, that's heavy. That's a, I don't know if I'm good enough to be a mentor, right? I'm not a perfect person. And I even realized quickly, Gladys, like men were more likely over time to become a father than a mentor. And so, so we, we got to move away from that word. Mm -hmm. So I put together my first original campaign, uh, creating visuals from real life big brothers, uh, in particular in our community, but also big couples, like married couples who both mentored a little brother together, um, which was kind of precious and unique for them to learn from, right? Married, um, happy couples. And then, you know, what, what do the big sisters look like? And, and how can you as an everyday person be this mentor figure? I called it the Everyday Heroes Campaign. And it really inspired everything I do in DEI today because it was about representation. It was about illustrating and inviting the kind of people that I wanted more from, right? These were my unicorns. These were the, the great examples of big brothers that I really needed more of. So I needed to show these real life big brothers in visuals, in our communication messaging, um, highlight them in media, right? And all the ways we do communication, but I needed their testimony and how they were making it work for them. And through that, we could invite others like them to come to the table. So now, right, fast forward 20 years later, that's in my book. I call it the invitation theory. Like people who come from adverse, diverse, or just minority, have whatever that number reason they're minority backgrounds, like just feel different from the others in the group, need that kind of invitation in to do something different. And for a lot of um, people of color that come from more collectivist cultures, where we focus in or on our family first, not so much that outer need or community, volunteering outside the family was a new concept too, I found. So that really made me think a lot about going upstream to make change and move the numbers and move the needles we say in PR talk. But that through line was, you know, just kept coming up and I kept tailoring and, and moving um, how I changed uh, and, and model campaigns based on this idea. And I moved from Big Brothers, from a nonprofit into a corporation HEB is a grocery company, big here in South Texas and in Mexico, and um, very well known for their, their support of DEI. And I worked in diversity and inclusion there. And for me, I could see the transfer from doing multicultural PR marketing into DEI work because I said, well, this is just multicultural PR, mm -hmm. but the cultures are even more expansive than I'm thinking of, right? It, it went beyond serving ethnic or racial groups. It was also women, people with disabilities, um, LGBTQ community members. So anyone who had been historically marginalized or disenfranchised. So while DEI and DNI is typically aligned with human resources, at HEB, that it was aligned with public affairs. And so I could bring that PR point of view into that work, but it wasn't certified then. And I'll tell you all this story is that it just, when you're working in your profession and something keeps coming up, it may be giving you a sign that you need to go deeper into that space. So once we hit 2020 and the world was upside down and the pandemic made us all question everything, and then the Black Lives Matter movement was hitting here in the US and I saw all kinds of PR pros really struggling with, what do we say, how do we say it? I realized, you know what, my experience in this space can be a real asset, not, long, not only to my clients and my team and my community, but to those that I can really impact at that national global level. And so I thought, I let me go ahead and get certified. What gaps um, and what else may I need to know on the HR side, on the legal side that I can then advise my clients? Because as you know, Gladys, a good PR pro is an advisor. We're a counselor. Sure. Sure. And, and often we should be the conscience of our yeah, organizations. So with as multicultural as our communities are and as, as um sensitive and raw as society has been these last few years, I thought it was really important for, for me to be grounded in this information, but then also for those who follow me to feel like I can be a trusted individual in this space. 
that's great. That's that's a great experience for you to share with us in your journey and your development, which is amazing. And I'm sure that could help others that are developing in this career to get motivated to learn more yeah. and, and to go deeper into what uh, DEI means in terms of the work that we can do for generating greater good. So in that in that lines, you you write about about you write a lot, I must say, about people and people and their culture, mm -hmm. which is not typical or usual in PR. What role does culture play in public relations in your view? Yeah, well, thanks for asking that, Gladys. And you know, it's not typical, and I think it should be, because culture is how we share our life experiences with others in a group we're connected to. It's really what it is. You know, a lot of us think of it in terms of, oh, food, right? Or music or how we dress, how we express ourselves. Well, yes, when we are born, whatever family we are raised in, whatever that looks like for you, right? Whatever that environment is, we pick up the shared behaviors and norms of that group environment. And that becomes part of our family culture and our lived experience. And parts of that may be fabric of being from, you know, origins from Mexico or different parts of the U.S. or I'm in Texas. And so what it means to be a Texan, you know, has a thought for people, but it's not necessarily our lived experiences. Right. So is what did my family for me, Gladys, teach me about what it meant to be who I am? Mm -hmm. And then as we grow up, we have the opportunity to shift and self-select the different parts that resonate with us as adults. Um, so I talk about culture a lot. And, and in fact, with the Public Relations Society of America, I had the chance to name my column. And I named it cultural strategy because I wanted to wade into this conversation strategically and carefully with PR pros. I didn't want to just stamp it DEI and then people go, that's that's a scary space. It's polarizing. I, I never do it right. Or, you know, especially our um, white counterparts feeling like they're being shamed for just who they were, right? Who they're born into, the bodies were born into. Those things should not limit us as humans. And, and so that's what my heart believes. And so I wanted to make sure, look, let me walk you through this and let's just talk about the strategy we should share as pros. And we connect what works in communication, we connect to that through our culture experiences. So when I write a column and I reference something from pop culture, right? Well, what is pop culture? That's popular culture. It's something that's happening in our time frame that a lot of people experience beyond whatever eth ethnic background they have, racial background they have, where they live, right? It points to commonalities. Commonalities. And so I think culture is a way for us to relate, understand each other, honor each other, respect each other, and, and unify. And so that's my, my belief, is that if you are a PR pro, that you're thinking people first, and you're looking to build those long-term win-win relationships, and that means you respect people, and you want to relate to them the way that they want to be related to. Great. In your book, you share must for aspiring PR professionals. But also you mentioned some progressive models about intersecting PR with DEI, which are very interesting models. Please tell us more about that specific model. Yeah, well, if you give me a minute, I'm gonna see if I can uh, work this webinar and show it. Am I good on your screen, Gladys? Yeah. Awesome. So this is uh, the first model I present. It's in the chapter about tailoring for multicultural communities and audiences. And, uh, you know, I was trying to find a cute, fancy name for, and sometimes it's just better to be clear, but this is how public relations and, and diversity, equity, inclusion naturally intersects, right? So if we're working as pros to become more integrated every day, we work on aspects of marketing and advertising, social media, organic content creation and social media, paid content creation. And we're working in, with influencers and communi community relations and public affairs. We need to integrate DEI into our work as well, because that's part of just being sustainable over time is working with who people are today and who they will become tomorrow. And our US census numbers alone with an undercount, by the way, shows that we're more multicultural than ever, Gladys. For the first time 
ever, the white population has decreased in numbers. And there's states like um, Texas where there's no longer a white majority. So Latinos are no longer a minority in the state. Well, what does that mean? Well, even term-wise, minority all of a sudden doesn't fit. And so how do you describe, right? So all this points to, for me, Gladys, is that we really need to look at models like this and push ourselves and say, you know, it's not just the same media relations game. It's not just the same work we've been doing. But if we're really honest and thinking about it, good PR principles and good DEI principles build great relationships with people. Mm -hmm. They foster goodwill. They help prevent issues, right? Or help us uh, stop them at a small level become, before they become a huge crisis. It helps manage reputations for companies. You see it all the time where the wrong word, the wrong tone, the wrong image, and boom, we have a case study on our hands of what not to do as, as social media managers and PR pros. Um, but then it's for the long haul, it's sustainable way because that is who our country is. That is who our world, um, makeup of our world is. And so we need to move with that change because the only thing that's constant about PR and life really is change. And so we need to get more embedded into this thought process is that if we're doing all these things intentionally for PR, building relationships, advising on ethics, right? That has to be, ethics is tied to respecting people, including them, making sure that they feel uh, that they belong and we appreciate what they bring to our workplace and society, that we're welcoming and that we're respectful. Like these things work out together, but too often I see in the PR profession that we silo them and we, we have this separation and there is not, there should not be a separation in our work. They're more integrated than ever. Yes build long-term relationships yes are mutually beneficial which is the main focus of our industry of our yeah so and later on Gladys I'm sorry um let me just make one more point please uh later on in the book in I think it's even in the last chapter 10 which is about really acting like a professional I take this model and again I'm walking pros through this progression right as I say well if we're doing the right things in terms of PR and DEI it actually intersects very well with social responsibility. Right. And that is what's truly sustainable, right? And building that long-term trust um, and that insurance that we need around our organizations that people are fallible, organizations are made up of people, someone's gonna make a mistake, but if you're doing the right things and being socially responsible, even at that individual level, you can have that impact of, of really supporting that long-term success of your organization and your own career too. So I would say that this becomes social responsibility and we can do that even whatever seat you're at. Solid, solid point. Thank so you. this uh, this analysis has led you to focus on inclusive communication. Mm -hmm. Why focus on inclusive communication first? Well, I think that it, it goes back to thinking about the business conversations we often hear, right? They're like, what is that return on investment on PR work? Or I don't understand how this aligns with our business goals. And that's all like nice to do when times are hot. But as we're seeing right now in 2023, oh, all of a sudden, a lot of these DEI promises that were made are not being implemented or fulfilled. And so I walk pros through inclusive communication first, because it it's going about looking at that upstream model and saying, let's go to where the problem is, that root cause, like I talked about before. And if we solve for that, then we can serve the most, the best. So with inclusion, the idea is that everyone is welcome and that they belong. And one of the concepts that I've written about in the book, as well as my column, I've talked about it on my podcast. Um, the gentleman's name is David Allison. He's a marketing and, and research pro at this point. And he has a um, initiative called the Val Value Graphics Project. And he really talks about, we need to get away from old demographics of kind of stereotyping people, right? Based on age and, sure. and whatnot. We don't behave like these old demographics today. 
So what are the people value? Because that's what drives their behavior. Well, guess what? Our values drive our cultural expressions, which drive our behaviors, which drive everything. So I said, oh, I love this. Let me dig one layer deeper and go into what do people value? Well, the number one value around the world is belonging and togetherness, right? And those things work together. You feel like you belong when you're part of a group. People want to be grouped. So we can't get away from this concept of, well, you know, a lot of times we hear from pros like, oh, we can't treat all Latinos the same, for example, right? We're not a monolithic group. We're not all the same. Absolutely. But there are some shared values in our group culturally, and there's shared values in PR pros as a group, right? And it's just very natural for humans to want to categorize. So we need to put grace around that as PR pros and say, okay, well, then let's look for that unifying connection point. And that's what inclusion really is. It's making people feel like they belong and to be to belong, they have to be respected, right? And so you hear sometimes in DEI work or this kind of conversation, well, we just need to tolerate people. Well, who the heck wants to be tolerated? I don't want to be tolerated. Like, you know, and, and, and I learned that early as a person, but then also with my career. Because the better I did a PR, like the more of a, a wagging finger advisor I was. And sometimes that doesn't make me a fan favorite. And that's okay, because what I'm doing is for the greater good and to serve the most that I can in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. So in this work, we're not going to make everyone happy, but if you can shoot for the majority, which is what inclusive type communication work is, then you're going to move the needle with the most number of people. And it tends to be the most calming, grounded, like softest approaches for pros. Great. Uh, in we have been talking about your book, hmm. making reference to different, uh, yes, Marta. Uh, what else can you tell us about your book when compared to other uh, textbooks available in the market? Yeah. What's, what makes it different yeah. for our uh, followers to, to know about it? Well, I really hope that all levels of pros will consider this book. So it's Smart Talk, Public Relations Essentials All Pros Should Know. And it's super strategic. And I'll tell you, like, you'll notice, right? You don't see, oh, um, and, and this is just part of disrupting who gets to have the mic and be an author and have a voice in society, but also in our industry. So one reason I wrote it, Gladys, was to really just pull back that curtain of what is public relations really? What is it today? And where is it going? So ha having the, the ability to have the conversation with them, I can now with all types of pros and seeing, okay, where is this? trending, um, I realized that, you know what, not everyone really understands that or knows that. But then there's so many unwritten rules about how to do PR, how to work with journalists, right? Um, how to understand strategic communication planning, the APR way, in a way that didn't feel like a textbook and was easy to understand. So I really wrote this as a uh, really like labor of love during the pandemic, because I truly felt like oh my gosh, like, should I die? I want to make sure that I left behind the mentoring that I meant to give to other pros, particularly pros of color. Um, I wrote this uh, as kind of a love letter saying, everyone is welcome to work in PR. And that's why it says all pros, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you are um, a journalist transitioning in and you think, oh, I know media relations, I'll be fine. Well, all the aspects of integration and integrated marketing uh, communication we have to do today, like you don't learn that in the newsroom. So I wanted to make sure like, hey, here's how it works really quickly. It's not a textbook, right? It's an easy to read a, a book that captures the best parts of practice that I felt like were A, essential, and then B, you know, progressive, like you said. So with the new ideas and models, that's helpful for practicing pros, journalists who need just a little bit of shoring up and just understanding. Um, but then I found for aspiring pros, I want to get to more students, particularly students of color early and say, hey, if you like communication, if you like English, if you like uh, just writing, if you're really in love with creative arts, like this could be a career, a career for you, even on the business side, right? And so just being, having that real talk about what's going on in the industry, what you need to know, 
I'm not to goof up in a lot of different ways I did because I learned PR in practice and not in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then for the few students who actually have a major that's in public relations who are you know, learning from textbooks, they may be learning from professors who aren't in practice and don't can't tell them the everyday um, happenings that actually happen in the workplace in PR. So I just wanted to bridge that gap from the textbook, right? Um, understanding to the real world. And particularly for, like I said, people of color. So as I was doing all this work, um, I'm very upfront in the introduction that, you know, Latinos make up 10, maybe 10.5% of all PR uh, practitioners as far as what the reported to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then half of that are leaders in the industry. And when you look at total people of color, it was only about 24%. And that's not the numbers of how our world is trending. That's not the numbers of how the U.S. is trending. And uh, I also wanted to just mainstream who gets to teach about this. One of the unfortunate situations I've been running into is that as a Latina with a book on PR, some of my counterparts, some of the, you know, um, the stereotypical like, or I would say pattern typical of what does it look like to work in PR? Well, the face of PR historically has been a white professional, a white female, mid thirties, forties practicing, right? But a lot of our leaders are white males and I'm allies with everyone. I'm married to a white male, right? Mm -hmm. So all the love. And, and like I said, our U.S. census numbers say we're more multicultural, which means more of us are in love with each other. And that's awesome. But I, what I will say is some of the microaggressions or just little unfortunate pokes or slights, you know, that I've gotten were from, from um, older, experienced, tenured leader white pros just making really inappropriate comments to me, you know, wow. speaking to me in Spanish when I, I wasn't speaking to Spanish with them. Um, assuming that, you know, that the book was just about Latina issues and culture and whatnot, when it's just, this is a mainstream book. So I know that in our, our country, we're fighting to get more representation in our films and music and whatnot, but we are the face of the U.S. Um, and more multicultural people. We're all very diverse, every single individual. And so we need to be able to represent that and also take our seats at the table and make room for others. So a lot of the projects that I stand up, Gladys, are self-powered, self-funded, because I just feel driven to say, we need more voices and different points of view. And I want to share that in the book to say, here's how you can contribute and do a great job as a PR professional for the long haul. Um, and yes, then you have done a great job Thank with you. your podcast, with your columns, with your book, and I commend you for that. And I thank you for allowing us to have uh, a window, a small window to, to see your experience, to get to know you better, to hear your experiences and to learn from uh, all your, your experience in the public relations field. Thank you, Melissa, for your time. It has been amazing to talk to you and to establish this interesting dialogue for Global Alliance in celebration of June, the Diversity, Equality, and Inclusion Month. We'll see you some other time. Thank you. Thank you.